Very good. I think we're going to get uh, started for today's seminar, Dr. Byrne. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce Dr. Byrne, who's our guest speaker for today's CTSI seminar, and he's a luminary in the field of uh, gene transfer therapy. So we've known Barry now for 15 years, and it's been a great pleasure. You can't hear me. Oh, my God. Uh oh It's going to be a problem, Steve. If, uh, Am I talking there? Or I no, I think let me just use a louder voice, Steve, and maybe the mic will pick it up. Uh, so, you know, Dr. Byrne has dedicated his career to pursuing novel gene therapies, particularly for diseases that lead to muscle weakness, respiratory insufficiency, and heart disease, uh, particularly Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Friedrich's ataxia, and Pompeii disease. Steve, you have to give me the thumbs up if it's no. You're not oh my gosh. Okay. Better? Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so Dr. Byrne has dedicated his life to pursuing novel gene therapies and sort of doing gene replacement therapies, particularly for diseases that affect muscle weakness, respiratory insufficiency, and heart failure, most notably Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Friedrich's ataxia, and Pompe disease. And his work on gene transfer is now moving into humans and promises to really fundamentally reshape how we give humans treatment, particularly for rare diseases. It's really spectacularly exciting to see that move forward uh, here and throughout the medical enterprise. So after obtaining his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Denison University, he pursued his uh, medical degree and PhD in microbiology and immunology at the University of Illinois, and then took uh, postdoctoral training in cardiology fellowship and pediatric residency at Johns Hopkins, and then joined the faculty at the University of Florida in Gainesville in 1997, where you've stayed ever since, to their good fortune. He's currently Associate Chair of Pediatrics and Director of the Powell Gene Therapy Center at the University of Florida, and he's also now the Earl and Christy Powell University Chair in Genetics. He's published over 260 articles, cited about 30,000 times, having an impressive impact on our published world. Um, and his work uh, actually has quite a profound impact. And one of the things I'll just comment on uh, for Barry is won you know, numerous awards from a variety of different organizations, including Innovator of the Year, which I think is very well uh, deserved. Uh, but in addition to his academic appointments, he serves broadly to move therapies forward. So he's chief medical advisor for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, has a substantial role to play there. He's a member of the TACT at Treat NMD to try to move and review uh, therapeutic programs moving forward. He's co-founder of Avante Bio, but he's also just a great human being. So we actually know Barry partly from our world in Duchenne of him hiking to the top of mountains and endless enthusiasm for participating with the community and accessibility to patients and uh, clinicians and researchers alike. So it's a great pleasure. And uh, I think when he leaves here, he's biking from London to Paris, if I understand correctly. So please welcome Barry Byrne, our speaker for today. I have this one, I think. Thank you so much, Dan. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, that was probably the best introduction I think I've ever had. So I'm going to end right now by saying thank you. No. Um, so I do have to share the screen here. And we will begin. Okay, perfect. So then everyone online hopefully can see that and hear me uh, well enough that um, thank you all for being here. I know in the post-pandemic era, it's so convenient to be in your office or in your pajamas, um, whatever works, but uh, it's great to be here in person and um, and visit UCLA. I, I think I was only here once before to the Harbor campus, interestingly. So, um, but it's great to see, like Stan said, old friends and colleagues. So I'm gonna make this a relatively broad uh, topic with uh, at the end, drill down into some of the specifics that we've been observing uh, in the clinical use of gene therapy um, where we have not been very predictive of some of the uh, events that have been observed in patients. Um, and hopefully uh, that knowledge of really 
doing this immune phenotyping that we think is important to better understand the mechanisms of immune response um, in, in the context of gene therapy. So Stian uh, thankfully gave uh, my disclosures. And I always wanna thank uh, our group uh, last week, we um, hosted Ride a Taxi. I'll, I'll touch on this at the end because I think, you know, as a community of both physicians, patients, um, providers, it's important to, to, to remain connected to the community and uh, that, that we serve uh, of patients. So uh, I'm from the other coast, uh, as Stan mentioned. Um, UCLA is right, right about here. Um, we do have lovely sunsets in Florida, um, but uh, our health science center uh, was the birthplace of AV vectors uh, now uh, more than 30 years ago when Nick Mazziska, uh came there from Stony Brook. <clears throat> and Bill Howsworth was another one of, of the early career faculty and our, our dean, uh, Ken Burns, were really all the seminal investigators just uh, working to discover AV vectors. So I do want to kind of touch on that past to, um, to, to pay recognition to, to them uh, and, uh, and look to the future about how the use of these um, tools will enable us to change clinical practice. And I think some of the uh, indications which are um, at the forefront of this are in pediatric medicine, but I think we'll see applications of this across various medical specialties. And so my own clinical activities of pediatric cardiologist, and although always had really one foot firmly in the lab uh, and less so in the clinic, other than now really in the second half of my career, really more as a clinical investigator, which is a whole different kind of clinical medicine that um, I think we're hopefully we'll see these two things merge. And what we've learned uh, in those uh, clinical research studies will influence ultimately clinical practice and talk a little bit about the work in SMA in Pompeii. And um, as, as Stan mentioned, we have a program in Friedrich's or Taxi. I'm gonna talk more about that from the standpoint of the, the value of engaging the community because they've been amazing group to work with. Um, and just this framework, I think is important to think about how we uh, partner um, both with the translational research enterprise, uh, train the next generation of investigators, um, develop qualitative tools that help us assess outcomes in patients, and then um, bring that back to the community that will develop clinical expertise. And we do that at our own institution through the Children's Hospital, our two uh, specialty hospitals in heart and, and, and neuro care, a regional network that now extends down to Scripps, Florida, and so very close to Miami, and then the external partners, particularly the state newborn screening program, which I think for any genetically defined disease is really helps uh, bring patients to, to medical attention before they have irreversible uh, symptoms. And that I think may ultimately come to play out even in Duchenne. Um, of course, we rely on federal and state um, funding to do that. And um, so the, um, the goals of this are really to improve patient outcomes ultimately and to develop a really transformative, I hope, opportunity for patients. And because that opportunity to early diagnosis through genetic testing would allow us to develop a targeted therapy. Um, the um, the real goal is to address the unmet need that exists in patients, which most of the time, these conditions have no alternative therapy. And this will improve outcomes and ultimately lower healthcare costs, although uh, it's particularly um, in front of us, and I'll comment on the uh, near-term approval of a product for Duchenne that probably will be the most expensive medical therapy ever delivered. Um, we thought we had reached that um, that pinnacle with uh, Zolgensma approved uh, in 2019 for SMA, but the larger size and increased cost of manufacturing of these products will, will undoubtedly mean that the Shen product is, is substantially more expensive than for SMA. 
Um, Iris Gonzalez, who's a geneticist at Nemours, uh, drew this great illustration of what mutation types uh, might mean if they were in terms of how you might knit a sweater. And um, I love this uh, because it, it really touches on some of the key topics of parts of which I'm going to describe in the few disease indications we're working closely on. You know, sometimes these harmless changes like this use of the red yarn really didn't affect the function of the sweater. That might be typical of a conservative missense mutation, but sometimes those amino acid changes are in critical parts like an enzymatic active site. And we see this in our Pompeii patients that have mutations that uh, might be missense mutations at the, at the critical area that is responsible for its enzymatic activity. And those proteins are effectively useless. Obviously, there's also other nonsense mutations that can cause severe dysfunction, like if this if stop codon occurs very early in your knitting experience. Maybe it won't be as dramatic if you lose one sleeve or actually have a splice site mutation that includes intronic material. Um, but this can also be very devastating, like the <clears throat> Uh, mutations that cause progeria, uh, which is one of the more severe manifestations of any uh, genetic disease is due to a simple single base pair change. Um, this whole class of, of, of insertions and deletions are obviously relevant in Duchenne. And then we're also working in the area of trinucleotide expansions where there's opportunities to both edit out the repeats or supplement the diminished uh, production of mRNA through the through those repeats. Um, so I'll try to provide an example of each of those. And simplistically, it would look like this if it were, if gene therapy were an oral drug, um, but it's a little more complicated. And luckily the package that we use to deliver AV is this parvovirus that was conceived of by Nick as a way to deliver genetic material into cells. And Mavis Abanji McKenna, one of our uh, faculty at, at Florida who uh, came, came there from Oxford as a structural biologist, developed this structure through um, X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM. And uh, this structure has been enormously important now in evolving AAV to the next generation of capsids that take advantage of this to topography on the surface to identify specific sites for receptors that can be rationally evolved to target different cell types, both in the brain and the musculature. Um, sadly, Mavis passed away last year from ALS, but her legacy uh, lives on um, uh, in, in the work that's coming out of uh, the structural biology and, uh, and Ken Burns' wisdom in bringing Mavis to, to Florida. So what happens after an AV vector is delivered into the circulation, for example, or even within the tissue, um, is that functional gene that's contained within the only cis-acting elements that are needed, these in in inverted terminal repeats, um, can travel to the target cell surface, bind to a specific receptor, and then be internalized into the cell. And there are a number of steps, obviously, that to traverse the cytoplasm through the lysosomal compartment and into the nucleus. And this is some of the uh, directed evolution that's now being applied to AV, both in the genome and in the capsid, is facilitating and increasing the efficiency of this reaction. Um, and so that uh, leads to a stable episome in most cases, at least in the case of muscle, which I'll principally talk about, um, and has been the basis for now evolving this uh, into um, current medical uh, therapies. And the original um, applications of this were not that long ago, in the late uh, 90s um, in 1989, and then the first application of this in ADA in 1990. And now my involvement started as I was starting my own lab where we showed that AV could effectively permanently transfer genes into muscle uh, and particularly also cardiac muscle where there is they are terminally differentiated. So in that sense, they're they're really permanent. Um, in the peripheral musculature, there's an important question that I'm going to raise about durability, um, because as we launch a, access to a commercial therapy, I think we'll now ultimately have cl clinical follow-up and the ability to do other uh, 
studies that assess durability that will be important um, going forward about how to sustain the effect of an AV vector delivered systemically. When, when the uh, first commercial approval occurred uh, with Zolgensma um, at Luxturna, th this was what the landscape looked like. So there were a lot of, of, of early stage activities in the oncology space. Um, there was, because it was an eye disease, the, the work that Bill did, uh, Bill Houseworth did for LCA, um, there were a lot of activity in, in, in genetically defined uh, causes of blindness and also in, in neurology, but a growing number of indications, both in hematology and metabolic diseases, but very few marketed therapies and a big gap here in the in the wasteland between pivotal studies and marketing approval. Um, that led, as I said, the commercial approval in 2017 of Luxturna. Um, we did the original NEI-sponsored studies at Florida, and then um, Spark Therapeutics, led by Kathy High, really got this across the finish line by developing important uh, novel outcome measures on defining the difference between functional vision and visual function. And they really demonstrated that by regaining, um, restoring L uh, LCA activity in the retina through this subretinal injection strategy that um, you can increase functional vision and not just a assessment of the retinal function. So the patients who received this therapy gained ability to navigate a maze uh, and, and that outcome measure was a key part of the marketing authorization uh, that's made this available. And that stimulated a lot of investment. So um, it's worth noting that, you know, the durable access to medicines requires some um, investment from the pharma industry because that's just the ecosystem that we live in that in order to make the drugs and provide them to patients, there has to be an investment in all the parts of that system to distribute them um, and uh, and make sure that that they re remain available. And the, the first uh, drug approval in Europe actually wasn't managed in that way. In fact, there were no uh, prescriptions for um, Glybera, the treatment for lipoprotein lipase deficiency, and it was withdrawn from the market. So no longer available to patients with that condition. So. This investment through, through the 2020 helped bring more indications into the field. And now you see the current landscape um, with still not many um, uh, sponsors crossing this kind of finish line into marketing authorization, but now a lot more activity in early stage companies. So um, this is a great time for patients who, any of whom have a condition that's being considered um, by those developing uh, therapies in, in all of these fields. And you can see now even new areas are being added, otology, dermatology, um, and obviously more activity in the ophthalmology and neurology uh, quadrant there. So we were able to do the first commercial uh, infusion of Zolgensma in 2019, and that was a an, an interesting experience unto itself because no payer had ever um, can contemplated how they were going to handle the authorization of a $2.1 million drug. Um, this infant was just diagnosed a few uh, months before the approval. So it was very fortuitous that they had been um, fully worked up and were waiting uh, until the approval came along. And then um, her brother was born a year and a half later, diagnosed by newborn screening and also treated with Zolgensma. And that newborn screening was really the key to now pre identifying pre-symptomatic patients, which is really where you would expect the best outcome, especially in conditions where um, changes in cellular survival, like in, in SMA, will are not reversible. So um, in, in any condition where there, there's the severity or rate of disease progression is such that um, you would lose function permanently, you see how rapidly uh, the US adopted newborn screening for SMA. And this is still evolving in Europe 
uh, despite the advent of treatments like Rizdaplam and Zolgensma and, and Nusinersen. Um, I don't know why Nevada is lagging. It's, they seem to be very backwards in that regard because this was uh, because of the rapid success of the therapy, Pompeii newborn screening actually was started five years before, but there was less evidence of what the impact of early treatment would be. And I'm kind of going to touch on that because some of our own work is in Pompeii and it would be a lot simpler um, if we had identified patients pre-symptomatically either for conventional therapy or for gene therapy. Um, this is, gives you an idea of how long it actually takes because even though there's a federal recommendation to, uh, to achieve newborn screening, uh, that has to be determined at the state level how to implement, how to implement and pay for the system. Um, so I think this will be really challenging when it comes to Duchamp because then um, it will, uh, the, the basis of the screening is a little more complicated than other, other conditions because it's based on um, detecting elevations in, uh, in CK and those can be falsely elevated for a number of reasons in newborns. So the secondary screening will add cost and probably lead to delays. But at least in the Pompeii world, um, this was relatively soon uh, adopted by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, but, but not adopted by, as you saw, all the states. And in Florida, I serve on the newborn screening uh, advisory committee and uh, Florida has a statute that after the federal recommendation, they have 18 months to make a decision at the state level. And not all states have that. As you can see, many states are still considering what to do. And um, and so uh, even in Florida, we were able to get this across the finish line and now um, have, the, have the ability to uh, diagnose both early and late onset disease uh, in the newborn period. That creates a whole new challenge now because now you have to tell parents that they have a child that might have a problem, not that will have a problem, that might have something that might be um, latent for 10 or 20 years. That creates a whole new set of, of, of challenges in terms of understanding the disease severity and, and timing of onset and what, to, what treatment is appropriate. So I'll, I'll go through some of what was typical at the beginning of this experience in Pompeii and what we're hoping uh, to do going forward. And part of this lesson is really uh, to re raise that point about sustained effect and of, er of an early onset myopathy. So here's what was told to Half families in the past. Just her lungs. Okay, her heart, her liver, these organs have been compromised and would have become fatally enlarged. Now, I wish that we had a drug to treat Pompeii, but we simply don't. I'm so very sorry. So you, some of you may recognize uh, PJ Byrne is now actually a really successful actor, but he was a walk-on to this part uh, in this 2008 movie about a family with two children with Pompeii. Um, and, uh, and that was really all that could be said in, in the early times before Lumazyme and, and myozyme were authorized, um, there was no option. And now the two children who were the subject of the movie are young adults. And um, Megan, the oldest, is actually a social worker. So it's amazing that they now have the, uh, have the opportunity to, to receive some form of treatment. They have many limitations, but that's the hope is that now uh, there is least established means to early detection, better understanding of the pathophysiology. And um, this like other glycogenoses is really due to the inability uh, to break down glycogen. So the, both the early and the late onset disease, which are really differentiated based on the severity of mutation type, have this same uh, defect. So glycogen then accumulates in lysosomes where this protein works at low pH. And because of that, um, we think part of the key pathology as I'll describe is not just the muscle disease that was the reason for the peripheral treatment with enzyme replacement, but it also a key feature of the neurological manifestations. We know that the severe mutations have the earliest presentation um, there are some ethnic 
uh, d differences and uh, founder mutations that are more commonly known to have null mutations, where there's very early onset cardiomyopathy and peripheral myopathy, but that as you increase the level of expression, uh, there is a, a reduction in the severity of disease, but later manifestations now we've observed both in respiratory function and ultimately uh, a peripheral neuropathy due to lower motor neuron dysfunction. So this is when I first started in this was the typical presentation of an infant with Pompeii. So this is a echocardiogram that shows the um, four chamber and uh, two chamber short axis views of the of the heart in an symptomatic infant. Now with newborn screening, we actually don't see this at all. Um, and in fact, you can see why they have respiratory difficulty the heart in a symptomatic infant now is so large that it completely would compress the left lung. These, these um, findings led to the need for a protein replacement therapy. And so we participated in this study, ultimately started in 2006 and completed in 2009. And you see that the principal finding of cardiomyopathy in the infant with Pompeii could be ameliorated by uh, enzyme replacement therapy. But although it reduced the mass to a, to a survivable level, it did not normalize uh, the LV mass. So, and then uh, enzyme replacement therapy also doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So it had an effect um, on, neuro, on neurodevelopment as well. And this is the landscape now. So um, you can see the problem is obviously not solved if there are really this many early stage programs, and now several gene therapy studies, one that we're conducting at UF, um, a, uh, an interesting molecule also in phase one that is a substrate inhibitor, a, an ability to block glycogen synthase with a product that Mays Therapeutics developed, and now three gene therapy studies that are in phase two all um, expressing the protein in the periphery with the hope of targeting the muscle disease, but not uh, again, um, focused on the CNS. And then now more than, this is the original product, uh, L-glucoside alpha myozyme and um, lumozyme uh, in the US and, uh, and, and in a second generation product, which is quite similar to this product developed by Amicus. Um, and so what we wanted, what I wanted to do is take a moment to describe, and this relates to hemophilia as well, the differences between any protein replacement therapy uh, and gene therapy. So periodic increases in the concentration of the protein and repeated delivery are required of a protein replacement therapy. And even though we think about gene therapy as being expensive, an adult receiving myozyme um, Will, uh, will cost our medical system about a million dollars a year for the product um, for their lifetime. And the infusion costs are added to that. Um, this is uh, disruptive because it requires a, sometimes weekly infusions that could take a half a day. So very difficult to comply with if you have a job. Uh, or if your whole family is involved in providing that care to a child. So um, gene therapy, on the other hand, is at least one time or infrequent uh, delivery. And the one time paradigm is probably only relevant to only neurological uh, diseases where CNS uh, cells are, are truly terminally differentiated. But um, we'd hope that it's really a very long-term solution and this may be a single or limited number of infusions, and the ability to uh, impact the CNS disease is a, is a key feature. Um, part of the reason we started to look more carefully at this is even though survival was the primary outcome measure of the uh, pivotal studies for lumazyme, um, the ventilator-free survival was not as stellar, and that over time, as we got past three years, you started to see a decline in the ability to re remain uh, free of, of assisted ventilation. And so we think we've, we've now, and this is the untreated natural history, you can see the dramatic change. Uh, this was uh, actually a historical cohort, so a very um, contemporary issue still today, 
uh, with the FDA is whether an adequate enroll and well-controlled study can have a contemporary control or a historical control group uh, as the external comparator. And in this case, these were historical controls and there were no active controls in this study, only 12 uh, uh, patients who received the product. That was sufficient because it was very, a lot like in SMA, very binary, if there was survival or not. Um, it gets a little more difficult when there are other outcomes to consider, but we think that the reason that that decay in ind independent ventilation occurs is because of the loss of lower motor neurons, particularly in the phrenic motor pool. We know that the glycogen accumulation does directly affect the muscle cell and loss of myofibrils and other perturbations in the muscle lead to weakness. But that weakness is accentuated by the loss of innervation of the muscle. And we've learned that that um, CNS component is now evolving as a new phenotype in treated patients. They have these manifestations, a loss of ocular motor nerve function, facial weakness, swallowing difficulty. All the adult patients usually present with nighttime ventilatory dysfunction and ultimately loss of ambulation. Um, so what can we do about that? We actually had to confirm that was true in humans. This uh, gentleman that was the subject of a case study um, had progressive loss of, of uh, his ambulatory function, ultimately uh, required a ventilator and then developed epilepsy. And because of that, he entered into hospice care and his brain and spinal cord were donated to the UF Brain Bank. And we found that he had a, a significant difference in cell size and number across the spinal cord and that it was most severe, particularly in the thoracic cord and the cervical cord that controls respiration. And his diaphragm was almost completely absent at that point. So these had been observed in the non-clinical models, but this was the first time we saw it in, uh, in human. And um, you can see that up close here in the phrenic motor pool of a, of a mouse, um, this uh, appearance of glycogen accumulation within the motor neurons is really the target of, uh, of our uh, approach using gene therapy. It's the physiologic manifestations of this. Again, these abnormal cell bodies uh, represent the um, disruption from glycogen accumulation, and that has a neurophysiologic outcome, a change in the power spectrum related to breathing, and uh, this reduced drive to breathe um, is what is particularly accentuated at night. Um, so the example of that physiology is here in a Cine MRI images of the diaphragm. And this was what led us to do the, the first um, gene therapy study in Pompeii was actually restoring um, GAA function just within the diaphragm itself. And you can see it's effectively paralyzed. This is really coming from the phrenic motor pool as well as from the muscle. So just to summarize those key points that the enzyme replacement therapy wasn't sufficient to correct all the aspects and this new neural phenotype was becoming evident, um, particularly as it relates to breathing. And uh, we studied that in actually four different models, uh, mouse, dog, rat, and in humans. And this is all resulting in motor loss of, of the phrenic motor pool. So that's why we turned our attention really to the gene therapy approach uh, as a way to cross the blood-brain barrier and reach, um, reach neurons that were affected, both in the brain and in the spinal cord. Um, the, the first uh, study we did, though, was in the peripheral musculature. I've mentioned the diaphragm, and I'm just going to touch on one other study, which is um, was started during the pandemic, so not fully enrolled yet, um, to, to look at the concept of redosing in Pompeii patients. So we uh, optimized a construct that expressed both in the heart, uh, peripheral musculature, and in neurons. Um, we uh, tested that in two different models. In this case, the mouse model, we showed that there was a dose-dependent increase in activity uh, that restored actually a reduced glycogen accumulation uh, to the wild-type level. And that's particularly evident in the heart. So glycogen accumulation um, leads to an increased mass in the heart. And you can see uh, there was a significant change compared to ERT in the gene therapy treated 
animals, as well as improvement in injection fraction <clears throat> and um, the left ventricular mass. So the um, goals, though, of getting this into humans, we had to further show, you know, the potential for direct benefit. This shows you what happens in myocardial function, com wild type compared to knockout, and then the AV treated animals have end systolic and end diastolic volumes that are identical to the wild type. And we have a program at the NIH to do this systemically in children that hasn't started yet, but I'll show you the results of the redosing study, which I think is a, also a preview of what we might need in Duchenne. Similar to the enzyme replacement therapy, you can see that in a different model now, when we made a rat model of this, there's early mortality that's rescued by the treatment, and um, particularly because of the effect on diaphragm and heart function. <clears throat> we also learned that part of the pathology is actually in the neuromuscular junction. So this is something that could be studied in peripheral muscle biopsies and, um, and probably as it contributes to the weakness. Um, this part of the brain, the medullary region, is also contributes to the speech and swallowing abnormalities in patients. And we see this in other conditions as well, where there's uh, central deficits that um, affect oral motor function. Um, this is now commonly observed in ALS patients, as, as well as in the FA population we study, where there are more sensory deficits that lead to dysarthria. But this is a really important to patients because they are very isolated if they can't communicate. And so we take that uh, for granted. The speech motor patterns are some of the fastest motor activities in the body. You just think it and how somehow it just uh, comes out your mouth. And so we're trying to understand this better with new techniques in understanding speech and swallowing. But I, I mentioned uh, the fact that it's an early onset myopathy. We have to think about uh, both the null mutations that would lead to anti-transgene effects and the durability of expression. So um, this is the, the basis for doing a study of redosing in Pompeii patients. Obviously, there are both immunological uh, considerations, like the transgene is not present in a null mutation, or, um, or the vector itself can cause activation of uh, the TLR system to uh, respond to the vector genome and eliminate those transduced cells. But there are also non-immunologic mechanisms like cell turnover or cell stress. And, um, and that's what we worry about in the Pompeii example about growth will be a uh, contributor to loss of those episomal vectors. So we designed this study in NHPs where they um, received either an excipient or an AV injection in each leg. And interestingly, in the uh, initial injection, if this is one leg and that's the other, um, we saw this expression in the immediate biopsies after dosing um, showed expression almost to this level. But then after the second dose, this level in the uh, contralateral leg was diminished. So reflecting an immune mediated loss of expression. But when we use an immune management strategy that I'll describe, it may also be relevant to Duchenne, we actually got higher levels of expression and the ability to re-administer the vector into the second leg um, by avoiding the anti-capsid and anti-transgene responses. So we uh, started this small study um, in adults uh, who received an IM injection uh, of AV9. And in the two cases so far, um, there has been no IgM or IgG response in this first patient, but in the second one, um, who we think re this represents the fact that they might have been seronegative to the vector, but not naive, they did have a response. Um, so we want to enroll more patients in this study because we can sh we've shown at least in the first patient that they um, have a positive response to the transgene. Um, and that this is a difficult without doing a systemic administration to biopsy the exact site where it was delivered. So we do need to enroll more in this study. Um, the other example I wanna give is in Duchenne, and then I'm gonna spend the last, um, uh, last 10 minutes or so talking about the, what we've learned in Duchenne about immune responses. 
So obviously a, a great wealth of information about Duchenne causes and treatments um, at the center here at UCLA. I won't go into that other than to describe what we've learned uh, from the study sponsored by Solid Biosciences. So um, Jeff Chamberlain designed this construct which removes uh, rod repeat regions in dystrophin, retains this NOS binding domain. It's the, currently the only uh, study using a NOS binding domain construct um, that contains the active binding domains as well as the C-terminal regions. And <clears throat> their non-clinical data was very impressive. Um, Certainly uh, in the absence of the vector, there's no sar sub sarcolemmal staining for dystrophin, but uh, in all the treated tissues, heart, diaphragm, tibialis, and the quadricep, and you can see quite extensive restoration of dystrophin staining. <clears throat> we had a, a grant with the Department of Defense and Joe Cornegay, this paper was just published last month, to look at the dose response across all these muscle groups in the golden retriever model of muscular dystrophy. And these helped enable um, the Ignite DMD program. Um, so the goal was to use this microdystrophin kind of depicted here to uh, restore uh, microdystrophin in two different cohorts of subjects uh, that at two dose levels. So there were the a bit potential ability to have both non-ambulant and ambulant patients in the study. Um, there, uh, in the first cohort, there was one um, teenager and um, who was non-ambulant. So the actually oldest subject to receive a, a microdystrophin gene therapy now five years ago. Um, and um, it did not restore his ambulatory function, but had a significant impact on his quality of life by improving his activities of daily living, ability to transfer himself and, and, and dress himself independently. Um, and then two other subjects in that group um, also had a, a lesser benefit than those in the higher dose group that, that we have long-term data on. But the primary uh, safety uh, events were safety, outcomes were safety, and these secondary endpoints of time function tests. Um, and as I said, this study, when it was conceived, would include um, children up to 17 years old. And, and I'll explain kind of where we stand now. So um, in, uh, in the range of uh, dystrophin expression, at the three month time point, oops, then uh, in several of the patients, we saw a fairly reasonable uh, dystrophin expression, but it was really in the longer term time points where there was really an increase in expression to this roughly 50% level, and in one case, even higher number of positive fibers. That's probably the more meaningful outcome measure than the percent of wild type uh, dystrophin. And so we, we we continue to follow these patients now because they have demonstrated, I think, important clinical outcomes. They have um, a, a greater than 100 meter difference versus their natural history and control cohort in the study in six minute walk test and, um, and an improvement of four points in the North Star, which I think is well accepted to be clinically meaningful compared to the other programs that are active. And then in terms of the respiratory function, um, a 19% increase versus the natural history study in forced vital capacity uh, and peak expiratory flow increase a similar level. So all helpful, I think, uh, measures, but it doesn't capture everything about what, what happens in a patient who receives these therapies. We have seen kids uh, gain the ability to run to play sports. Um, this is something that boys with Duchenne don't normally experience. So that's probably been, despite all the focus on time function tests, these simple things about um, their change in their quality of life uh, has been the most rewarding. Um, so the, the takeaway from this was that, you know, there, there were measurable changes in this small cohort and that now SOLID has moved this study to use another AAV capsid which they believe will have a greater effect at the equivalent dose. And that study should start next year.
But what one of the things we learned in this study, because some of the children were older and that 14 year old uh, was enrolled was actually the first patient to experience an adverse event related to thrombotic microangiopathy. So both because he was 40 kilos at baseline and even though he was in the lower dose cohort, um, uh, we, we learned it about two weeks after dosing that he had developed renal insufficiency. Um, didn't require dialysis, but subsequent patients did. And that led us to start to, to really try to carefully phenotype the changes after dosing um, in, in uh, the response to AV. <clears throat> so anyone who wants a review of all about the things that matter for measuring immune responses. Uh, we collaborated on this paper with the group at Pfizer. It's a very comprehensive review of how to assess anti-AV antibodies. And I just put this here to, to tell you that that's a, a great resource, I think, for capturing both uh, the methods used to analyze these data, as well as um, what investigative strategies there, there are being considered to mitigate the effects of, of both pre-immunity and uh, response after exposure. <clears throat> Just to summarize that, we know that some of the responses are innate and immediate after exposure in the range of hours after an AV exposure. And considering that we choose patients for the therapy who are seronegative, um, almost everyone is going to have an innate response and to varying degrees, the adaptive responses lead or what have led to the uh, safety events. Um, Jordan Abbott in Colorado was part of a um, symposium we did two months ago. And I think this captures a lot of nice features of what happens in the first wave of immunity. Um, if you think about what happens in the fluid phase, the antibodies, whether they're preformed that might be cross-reactive or in response to the AV capsid, activate complement. And I'll show you what we've done to assess that. These can also happen on the cell surface, influenced by toll-like receptors, antibody on the surface, and certainly other MHC presentation of the capsid proteins. And then there are intracellular effects that are due to the viral DNA that I mentioned before. And you see all of these potential effector molecules um, seem to have a big impact on safety. And this is a summary of some of the current safety events observed in AV studies. And uh, you can see uh, they're fairly frequent, unfortunately. In the Estella study, uh, significant liver toxicity uh, leading to a fatality in four of those individuals in this study remains on clinical hold. Um, Rocket Pharma had several cases of thrombotic microangiopathy in their study on uh, Dana's disease. Um, and similarly, even in Zolgensmug patients in commercial use now, even though there have been 3,000 doses delivered um, um, and without a REMS program, we're uncertain about the total uh, number of adverse events, but it appears there may be up to 20 deaths uh, nationwide uh, so far with, with this therapy, uh, worldwide with this therapy. Um, so only about 1,000 of those 3,000 done uh, treated in the U.S. So a huge accomplishment, obviously, to make this a transformative therapy available to patients, but it shouldn't be done without all the cautions that come with understanding. I, I mentioned the events in the solid bio study um, there have been some similar problems related to thrombocytopenia in the Novartis study, and then uh, there was one fatality in the Pfizer study in a adolescent with Duchenne, as well as a, a death recently in an adult Duchenne patient at a, at a lower dose. <clears throat> so we've, we've been considering how to block these immune responses, and part of this was derived from our work in Pompeii to prevent anti um, myozyme antibodies or anti-drug antibodies, and it involves the use of rituximab to eliminate B cells. Um, it, that is augmented by uh, the use of uh, serolimus, and so together we think this combination actually has an effect both on cytotoxic T cells and on the antibody response, so I'll describe what we've learned from that, and I don't need to explain why this is a a problem overall because of not just adverse events, but because uh, um, because this impacts the efficacy. <clears throat>
So several programs now have implemented a strategy to block antibody responses, um, including the two studies uh, we have done at University of Florida, the first of which was in Canavan's disease. So we um, blocked the anti-ASPA and anti-AAV uh, responses in a uh, two-year-old who received this dual route of administration um, with rituximab and sirolimus. This was the basis for all of the patients that were in the sio sponsored study in GM1 ganglocidosis and also part of EPIC's program in ALS, as well as now Rocket adopted this approach for Dannon's disease and um, 4D molecular therapy just announced that they will implement this in their ongoing study in Fabre disease. So what we learned by tracking now 40 patients uh, um, daily over, uh, over the first two months, two weeks after AV therapy is that there's this sharp rise in D-dimer, which is representative of the endothelial disruption or, um, associated with uh, thrombotic microangiopathy, but patients who had no antibody response in the red shown here that were immunosuppressed did not have that finding, and they did not have the downstream effects of complement of the terminal membrane attack complex, but you can see this distinct increase at day five in all the uh, patients who had no immune suppression other than glucocorticoids. <clears throat> this is... Um, driven by both the IgM and IgG response. And this is the point at which it's activated What once the once these antibodies are detectable. Um, and again, with, with the immune suppression, we saw no IgM or IgG and therefore no downstream effects. So this happens through the classical complement pathway. And one of the reasons we think that this is a safety issue is this part of the equation. So the C3A and C5A cleavage fragments that lead to the terminal um, membrane attack complex are very potent anaphylatoxins. And those uh, are lead to the myocardial dysfunction that we've seen now in patients because of their ability to cause um, uh, water to leave the vasculature and loss of intravascular volume and tissue edema. Um, so the um, the classical complement pathway is not the only one activated. Um, we think that there's actually a direct effect of the vectors also on C3 uh, because we measured uh, two other unique parts of the pathway, um, factor B and factor D, that are involved in this alternative C3 convertase. And this serves as an amplification loop for, uh, for the classical pathway. And we've not found any indicators that the lectin pathway is involved. Part of the way we can assess that is by measuring um, the C3 levels and you see depletion of the C3 when complement is activated. The uh, level of C4 at baseline is less, so the depletion is even more profound. And um, that also these other antigens, uh, BA and BB are indicative of the alternative pathway. We studied these two things also in vitro, and you can see that both the common pathway and the alternative pathway are activated um, by AV uh, in combination with the antibody. And so we drew this really schematic of all the events that happen after dosing, and um, it's really all principally driven by antibodies um, that we think are possible to eliminate in this system. So uh, I, I think we have time for some questions. I'm gonna end now and, um, and take both questions online or from anyone in the audience. I do wanna emphasize you know, that this has been one of the great uh, opportunities to work with both the Duchenne community. This is uh, the group that turned out for a fundraising event in Gainesville last week um, that is uh, sponsored by the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. And certainly, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity to really benefit patients like those with SMA that you can see the before and after of several of these children that were some of the earliest recipients of Zolgensma um, that are now walking and doing well with, uh, with at least uh, most greater than five years of follow-up. So I'll end there and we can take questions. We just have just a few minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Barry. Yeah.
Perfect. And we actually have to vacate the room close to one. So we actually gonna have just time for maybe one or two quick questions. And I'll give it to people in the audience here if you have some. Yeah, some of the questions online are lengthy. So we wouldn't have time. So anyone here have a question? Very good. What's your, I'm sorry, some, well, what's your estimate for how long these gene therapies will exist as episomes in humans? So in the peripheral muscle, uh, I think there's an interesting problem created by the heterogeneity. We know that uh, kind of at best or on average, 50% of fibers are not transduced. So there, one would have hoped that they're protected by those that are corrected, but I'm starting to worry that in fact, that the corrected fibers may exaggerate the level of damage and the uncorrected ones that are adjacent to them. It's a very simplistic kind of view of it, but we have seen now uh, in children that are more than four years post-treatment a decline. Um, and so that makes it really urgent that even though there are these early benefits that I you know, don't want to take away from the fact of the benefits, there's and and the way to manage the risk, um, I do think it'll be incumbent upon us to really figure out how to sustain the effect over over the lifespan, and particularly as we move to earlier treatments, which is likely to have a greater near term benefit, but a less of a long term benefit. Very good. Well, thank you. I think we have to thank Dr. Byrne for coming. Thank you all. Thanks online, folks.